Welcome back to episode 5 of WNBA Retrospect, the historical WNBA scouting series. Today we'll discuss Lauren Jackson, the greatest international prospect to enter the WNBA in league history out of Australia. Lottoman's basketball starts now. Ogumba Wallet for the win! You are locked on women's basketball. Your daily podcast on women's basketball. You are Locked Women's Basketball. Thanks for making us your first listen every day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcast and on YouTube. My name is Hunter Cruz. I'm your Saturday host covering prospect scouting and women's basketball at large. I'm joined by my co-host, M. Adler and Lincoln Schaefer. M. covers the WNBA in the New York market with a focus on player development and analysis at thenexthoops.com. Lincoln is an indispensable part of our scouting team. You can find him on Twitter at Dovinia underscore. As I said, our conversation today is... Australian big Lauren Jackson. So let's take you back to 1999. Prior to Jackson's WNBA career, she starred for Australia at the 2000 Olympics, going toe-to-toe with longtime rival Lisa Leslie. She was a no-doubt number one overall pick in the 2001 draft by the Seattle Storm, and the rest is history. So starting off with you, Lincoln, um, from watching her pre-draft film, what jumped off the screen for you like originally? Yeah, watching... LJ play uh, on the senior national team at 17 or 18 years old, which is uh, when she first started playing real minutes on the Australian senior national team. Uh, The first thing that jumped off the page to me is her burst as a 6'6 center, uh, putting the ball on the floor. She's blowing by uh, opposing bigs whenever she really wants to and just getting to the rim and um, displaying the ability to score at all three levels, which is insanely impressive as a 17 or 18 year old going up against seasoned pros and um, like some of the best players in the world. She's just scoring from all three levels on the ball, off the ball, constantly getting into the paint and creating good looks for herself and others uh, and displaying like levels of patience uh, in her scoring approach that are incredibly rare for a 17-year-old who's um, just starting to play at the highest levels. She's it's, – it's a ridiculous experience to watch, like, young Lauren Jackson play because of her combination of size, movement skill, length, and athleticism. It's just – it's so impressive to watch. See, that was the second, the second thing that stood out to me. The first thing that stood out to me was – and this is just because of the era it was, what's out to me was how almost perfect her innate sense of movement was. Because this is the thing that we talk about when it comes to big prospects these days. I keep bringing this up every week just because of the off-ball game. But this is something we talked about in the pod last year with Rakia Jackson. This is something that we're going to talk about extensively this year when it comes to Aaliyah Edward, Cameron Prink, Angel Reese is what do you do when the ball is in your hands, not just getting yourself open for shots or screening for teammates, but literally what are the instincts you have as to where to move and how to manipulate the court? And this time, this is this is the era of two posts. And I mean, the, the two post era really started for another decade and a half, at least in the WNBA. But this is a time when, you know, if you had the ball at the key and you passed it and you and you hit a dive and you weren't immediately hit on the basket cut, you would just walk five feet and then post someone up and just wait for the ball. No, that's what Team USA is doing. No, that's not what Lauren Jackson does. Her her instinct is almost perfectly, again, at an age when she's still seven, eight years off from her prefrontal cortex being fully developed, her instinct is to hit the cut, be open quickly, and then if she's not there, she immediately clears to the corner. Not the short corner, the corner. She, We'll we'll see in her Seattle career how that changes because they play a little different. But she also develops not just clearing the corner, but clearing the weak side wing. Which again, just how she moves around the perimeter as well. It's it's not you know like Allie Quigley levels of getting yourself open off the ball for shots and moving into passing lanes. But it's so good. It's so advanced for someone that age. And then when you notice right after that the scoring package then that really unlocks the idea of all the different ways that she can score without having to be schemed for it. 
And yeah, like recently I've been watching a lot of FIBA tape. So it's crazy to watch someone that was 19 years old playing against the best players in the world and then compare that to watching some 19-year-olds playing against like their age group. At 19 years old, she was playing – when I, when I say go, going toe-to-toe with Lisa Leslie, she was playing at that level from from the jump, and just what she did was super impressive. Um, like I think I, I said to you, I was like, this is one of the five best players in this game at 19 years old. She was just everywhere on the court. You talk about – I think she had three or four blocks in um, one of the games we watched. Mm-hmm. But I just think overall – just such a complete prospect. Um, I think what you said is like this. We we don't even we don't even deserve this player nowadays. That's how good of a player she was then. How good of a prospect she was. Like, there's aspects of her game that you see in prospects today. Like her movement abilities. It's like similar to kind of like Ryan Howard. Um, you see the the push shot mm-hmm. with with like Maddie Segrist. These skills that she already had in 1999, 2000, which is just crazy to watch. Yeah, we'll get to um, – I'll talk specifically about that sort of uh, deserving piece when we get to her WNBA career. But as far as what you were saying about going up toe-to-toe against the best players in the world, I mean, in the USA warm-up game, she was probably the second best player on the court. In the Olympic game, she was, uh, at least as far as I watched, the best player on the uh, in the game. And this is – at the absolute height of Cheryl Swoops' power on both ends of the court. It's absolutely ridiculous what she's able to do, both, again, not just as a quote-unquote stretch five, not just as someone who's, you know, positionally versatile a little bit between the four and the five. This is someone who is getting chased down blocks in transition. This is someone who is an absolute menace as a rim protector. And and someone who, on the other end, is coming, as you like to point out in our group chats, is hitting these movement shots off flares at a horns action and then banging it down low and scoring over Lisa Leslie. This It's absolutely ridiculous the number of things she's able to do. And the combination of, like I mentioned, the, the sort of cerebral polish to it, but also doing all these things while clearly being unpolished in the, in the sort of basketball finesse way of it, which is not a bad thing when someone's this good because it just means there's that much more to unlock. It's It's kind of crazy that in her first couple of years in the W, especially her first year, she didn't actually hit the ground running and that she had to find her shot a little bit. It's it's really weird knowing that and going back and watching literally two years prior and she's dominating the U.S. Olympic team. I have no idea how that happened. I have no idea. I, I blame the coaching. She, she was going right at the defending defensive player of the year, Yolanda Griffin, who was 30 mm-hmm. years old. I yeah, T- Team USA was starting. Yeah. Team USA was starting what for the first couple eras of the WNBA were the two best defenders in in league history in Yo and uh, Leslie, and it barely mattered. Yeah, it's LJ just, was just insane. <laughs> the the combination of footwork, the, the combination of footwork and coordination without foul, the ability to do so with, without fouling was so ridiculous to me. It's, I mean, getting into the a little bit of the scouting up and in a little bit and going away from just uh, the uh, h- hype over how insane she was. In terms of projecting it to a pro level, obviously she's going against pros. There's not that much to like say, oh, this will or won't work. Um, but just in terms of seeing where does this player go from here? I mean, between the instincts and health and the ability, to, like I said, impact the ball both through steals and blocks without fouling, to prevent post position, but also be able to, honestly, in some pick and rolls, hit hits some emergency switches and look like she was holding up pretty well, again, as a 17, 18-year-old. So with that on the defensive end, there is a lot of room for growth. As someone who was already sort of a dominant defender, there is a lot of room for growth that makes you say this could be the best defender in to this point for a short period of time, but could be the best defender in WNBA history. On the other side of the court, Lincoln, like you said, that three-level scoring ability, that driving ability, that's what, you know, after I got over everything that we've talked about, that's what really stood out to me as the most sort of looking forward, really unicornish thing with her was that, you know, I wanted to see her used as a driver a little bit, even more than she already was, but, you know, for someone her age, for how difficult driving is, just because of what it demands of you physically in so many different aspects as compared to just posting up. 
or spotting up, even off movements. You now, for someone that age, is understandable. But there was there is so much just ability in terms of getting downhill, in terms of how she was able to read the court. Um, the passing wasn't there, but the decision making was, and it makes you think this could be a dominant driver. Not even not even attacking tilted defenses, but actually from just a set half court getting downhill. Her handle, there's not much of a handle, but but her her dribble control was excellent for a center. Um, yeah, I mean, even for today, her ability on pull-up shots to get her shoulders square was unbelievable. It reminds, uh, reminds me of what Gino said about Stewie. It doesn't really matter how she goes up. Her, her shoulders are always going to be square to the basket. And yeah, I just mean like, she clearly preferred going to her right than to her left. We'll see if that, we'll see if that develops, teasing a little bit forward. Um, but no, there is the kind of game that you see in this prospect where you say, this is someone who within a, like three years, you might want to give like a 35% usage to and just sit back and watch her score 28 a game. All right, so after the break, we'll get into our scouting grades on Jackson. I feel like it'll be pretty easy, but um, <laughs> you'll have to wait for us to, to get into that. Picking up burgers and hot dogs for summer barbecue. So why not get cash back with Ibotta? Ibotta gives you cash back on hundreds of groceries from produce to personal care to pantry goods. So you can make sure you're beating inflation no matter what you're purchasing. Either link your loyalty account or upload your receipt after your shop and get cash back. It's that easy. The average Ibotta user earns $120 cash back each year, which would cover an entire shopping trip, or, or you could use that towards your cash back, towards a flight you've been eyeing. Other apps you give you points that don't amount to much. With Ibotta, you get real cash back that you can cash out to your bank account, PayPal, or gift cards. Right now, Ibotta is offering, offering listeners $5 for trying Ibotta by using code Locked On when you register. You can download Ibotta app for free on Apple and Google Play. That's I-B-B-O-T-A with code locked on. Welcome back. I'm your host, Nick Cruz, and thanks for joining us. Let's get into our scouting grades on LJ based solely on the film you watched from her pre-WBA draft um, Oh, did days. I mention, by the way, in our last segment that she was like a plus-plus rebounder? Because that's important. <laughs> yeah, but um, taking it, we're gonna be we're gonna be taking yeah. into account um, just the state of the league, what was valued, um, and rather than current philosophies and current scheme stuff we see nowadays. But first, for those unfamiliar, we use a baseball like twenty eighty scouting scale. A forty is an average WNBA contributor. Forty five is a top end backup. Fifty is your average starter. Fifty five is your above average starter. Sixty is an all star caliber player. 70 is an all WNBA caliber player. And finally, 80 is like reserved for your MVP candidates, um, first team all WNBA caliber players. So now that we've got that out of the way. basis too. Right. Someone who will be an MVP candidate multiple years in their career. Right. So, um, M, you want to start off with this? It's an eight. She's a role. She's a, she's an OFP, which stands for um, uh, one for Jim and She's an eight. It's... You know, we haven't had one of those on this pod before. We had a soft eight in Shamik or a soft seven in Shamiko last last week. It's it's an eight. There's there, there's not much to um to talk about with this. Uh, in terms of the skills, in terms of the era, it doesn't matter. Yeah, it's kind of hard for me to imagine a better offensive center prospect when you combine the the movement skills the ability to just blow by any kind of big that's defending her and also back down smaller defenders, uh, the mid-range shooting, the free throw shooting, the ability to live at the free throw line, and the three-point shooting that's just kind of an added bonus for that era. It's it's hard for me to imagine a better offensive prospect as out of a 6'6 player. And that is not to mention the fact that her defense might have been better than her offense at that point. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I had some concerns in terms of what you're saying. I guess I quote unquote have some concerns in terms of what you're saying about in that era, is all of that going to be used? And we'll get to that. Um, but even if it's not, like you said, she's so good at so many things, it doesn't matter. You can underuse her and still have an eight. 
All yeah, right, she so could I... be utilized as a post scorer, a a perimeter driver, or like a spot up shooter or a movement shooter, and mm-hmm. she can do all of those things. Yep. So side question: In our Margot episode, we we said okay, she's a forty forty five then, but like nowadays, this is more of a thirty. Do you guys do you guys agree that in this era she's an eighty, or where you guys? I don't is know. there is there a number is higher there, than eighty? Is there a ninety? 90? Is there a yeah. 90? Is there ninety? Hunter, I assume you have her as an. I assume you have her as two thousand and one eight and a and a twenty twenty three eight. That's what's super rare. That's kind of what we're hitting on here. That like there's some prospects where their games don't really scale up. But like then, yeah, this is a player that based on what teams are valuing is an eight. But like even nowadays, just how her game just would scale in every aspect of her game is just. It's pretty crazy to just to see. Okay, I don't. I don't know what they were doing in Australia, but yeah, I mean. <laughs> that they had it. So, so, so this is a perfect segue actually into talking about what actually happens with her because, like you're saying, this is what I'm talking about in terms of whether or not did we did we deserve to actually have a player like this in the WNBA? Uh, I I don't know how much how much of you guys watched of the LJ era storm. Not as much as you. <laughs> yeah, not not as much as you. I don't got fifty. Well, it wasn't. 60. That, that that wasn't necessarily the the the, the answer I was looking for. I'm just, I'm just wondering how, how um, many games you might you might have seen. But like, so I've I I've watched a solid at least like I mean obviously we've all seen like highlights and stuff. It's easy enough to find some of them these days. But no, I've seen a solid dozen or so full games of hers from the Storm era across the years, and it's clear that one thing is her pure athletic prime. You know from basically the time she was drafted until uh, age 26 27 it's it's clear that her pure athletic prime she was she was underused like slight like, severely she also in that span won two mvp awards which gets to the earlier point of and again they were very deserved which again gets the gets the point we were just saying lincoln you and me about how you can use her not to the full extent of her abilities and you can still have an mvp this is the ridiculous part about her game, but it's also the part about the fact that again, in in the in the in the aughts, the WNBA did not deserve her, and I think, like you're saying, today we barely deserve her because I think the the sort of closest straight WNBA comp in terms of same position and skill set is Asia Wilson. That's not the comp I want to get to later, but just in terms, but Asia is a five. We know she is a five. She plays the defensive four next to Candace these days, but she plays the offensive five with Candace at the four. We saw what she looked like when she was at the five last year. We saw what she looked like at the five when she was in the wobble, but Bill Lambeer, who is Bill Lambeer, and for as good as he is advancing the game off the court, the on the court was a little tricky in, in his last couple of years. We saw what it looked like when he played Asia at the pure four next to a very traditional center, you know, uh, either Kia Stokes the bench lineups or more notably Liz Cambage when they were starting together. And it's it was nowhere close to what Asia could do on her own. And again, Asia Asia is right now on my top 10 all-time WNBA players already. And yet she's not Lauren Jackson offensively. She does not have that level of threat and that level of creation and versatility. And even and even so, it's that hard to get to have gotten Asia to where she is in terms of being able to unlock her full game. It took bringing bringing one of the most no doubt heralded uh, men's NBA coaching candidates of all time to come over to the W side and instantly be the best coach in the W by far to do that. This is the thing with Lauren Jackson is she goes through two head coaches in her first uh, quick math, I think six years, seven years in the W. And these are Lynn Dunn, who was a who ends up being a much better executive than head coach, and and Donovan, who was not a good head coach, flat out. Um, despite dis, despite winning a title, not a good head coach. You see, when Brian Angler is hired in 08, Brian Angler is top five all time and wins in the WNBA. Part of that is the teams he had, but he's a solid coach by those standards. Nowhere near Becky Hammond, but solid. And you see, he has the right idea conceptually but not in execution and that he s- starts playing a bunch of two center lineups where lj is the four lj being one of the other centers she's she's playing the four and that's the idea that that, that i'm looking at when i'm looking at lj's game 
as we're just talking as a prospect, the driving, but especially when it comes to the WNBA and how her skills develop, is you can see offensively, she's she's like a four or five offensively. I'm not like in a tweener way. And like a, she is the best offensive four in the W. She's also the best offensive five in the W at this point. It does not matter sort of what you highlight her. And this is the thing for me about Lauren Jackson. Lauren Jackson is not the best. I don't think Lauren Jackson is the best center of all time in the WNBA. I think she's the best wing of all time in WNBA history. She simply happens to be a rim protector at six foot six. Her offensive game from the outside in absolutely destroys defenses whenever she's given the opportunity to, to play the five but be outside, which happens sort of in the later 09 to 2010, 2011 range. It doesn't happen before then. And even in that range, it's it's it doesn't happen as often as it should. And that's the real travesty about about the era in which she played is she is a three-time MVP. She is a no doubt top five, top six player of all time. If she's not in your personal top five, top six of all time, your list is wrong. I'm sorry. There's no way it can possibly be right. But even so, the skill set and the things that we saw, she could have and should have been so much better. Her usage rate, even in her prime, was like in the mid 20%. There's no reason why it shouldn't have been cracking 30 every year. She was that good. It's, we'll, we'll get to it when we get to the comps in our next segment coming up after the following break. But there is a good parallel here on the men's side. And even then, it took until recent years to really unlock it. It's ridiculous how talented she is. And the fact that we're going to go a decade, maybe even two in the future. And that's when you get to the point in time LJ should have come out. That's how advanced she was. Yeah, so after the break, we'll get into some comps. And then also just a little fun exercise on just creating the best front court combination in WNBA history out of like any all-time players. All right, so we're on to our comp section. So I'll give it to you, Lincoln. Just what are your comps Aww. here for, for LJ? Yeah, LJ is a historically kind of unique player. Um, there's no direct analogs for her <laughs> because of just like what she is as a player. So uh, the first thing that struck me watching her shoot the ball was what if Elena Deladon moved like a guard? Which, and, which, to be fair, before the back injuries, Elena Deladon yeah. did move like a guard. But even even watching some of uh, Deladon's tape at Delaware, she didn't ever have the same level of movement skills as LJ. Um, yes. But still, still like a better athlete before the back injuries, but not quite to the level of Lauren Jackson. Um, mm-hmm. And the one that struck me watching just her movement skills as an 18-year-old playing on the senior national team was – a, a young Kareem Abdul-Jabbar playing at UCLA. The the grace, the bounce, uh, living at the free throw line, like just the way she moves, the dominance as a rim, rim protector, and the um, just like fluidity uh, in that body is it. It was like looking at a, a young Kareem playing at UCLA. So you know how we've talked about Lauren Jackson being the best player going up against like. To, like probably the best team USA on the women's side ever, right? Mm-hmm. You know the story about Kareem at UCLA in his freshman year, right? Yes. Yep. Hunter, do you? Um, I, I, I say you talk about it for a second. Good, because I need you to play the part of someone who doesn't know because I'm sure a lot of the listeners <laughs> don't. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, if he had gone straight from high school to college, to the, the NBA, he probably would have been one of the best players in the, in the NBA history. The reason he is regarded as the best basketball player or having the best basketball career, if you include college of all time, is because of what he does at UCLA. He gets to UCLA, and he's so good. Again, he takes a he takes an expansion basketball team in the NBA to a title in his second year in the league. He gets to UCLA. And the way it often works is, you know, you'd have the the varsity, the starters scrimmage against the freshmen. And so in this, so in his, I think, fall or like the summer he was, he, he got to campus, 
it's him and the other and the other freshman squad playing against uh, the varsity starters. And Kareem doesn't just win. He doesn't just will his team to win. They they win pretty handedly. As a freshman, again, going out against these guys who've been in this training program, the the kicker is the UCLA varsity team they were playing against were the reigning national champions. So that's a so so that is an excellent comp from a winning perspective. Yeah, I like it. What about you, Em? So I am so fascinatingly, this is the first time like and I have had two completely different sets of comps, which I love. So the the first comp that that came to mind, and this is what I was sort of getting at earlier on the men's side, you know, having to play like this and finally unlocking them in recent years. The the obvious comp to me on the offensive end and the kind of extended defensively was was Joel Embiid. Joel Embiid in recent years, I think, and Lauren Jackson are some of the most similar players I've ever seen. Because with what I'm talking about, about Lauren Jackson being the best offensive wing, there's something that Ben Taylor of Thinking Basketball has talked about uh, earlier this year with Joel Embiid. It's one of the reasons he's he is probably the best individual scorer in, in basketball is because he is just a seven-foot, like 260 pound offensive wing. He he has he has triple control like a wing. He's able to pull up, drive from the outside, shoot from the outside, uh, pull up for a jumper like a wing. And that's what makes him so unfair. That's what makes Lauren Jackson so unfair offensively as well. You also have that defensive versatility. Lauren Jackson is a more consistent and able defender than Joel was, but you also have that sort of same level of versatility and ability, but Lauren Jackson's just more of a vertical player than Joel is, as ridiculous as that sounds comparing the two games. Um, but that's the thing that I'm saying, like Joel Embiid, it took until the past basically two seasons on the men's side to actually ex expand his offensive usage past just like the 15 feet to actually becoming playing like a wing and a driver. It took us that long on the men's side to see someone with this sort of unicorn skill set and give him this level of usage. That's why I'm saying Lauren Jackson was at least two decades into her time for any league. Uh, my other comp is... Um, and this sort of stood out to me in terms of how they looked at first with, with the hair, with the style, how they moved. And then it, the, the game kind of became obvious to me after a certain point. It's like, she's like if Stewie was a little bit taller and could hang defensively at the five, but run less pick and roll. Still, plus passing for a position. You see that thread of W and Guerrero, and it's just a shame we didn't see her create off the dribble more. Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of intersection of just long athletic forward bigs that you see nowadays that you're like, okay, this Lauren Jackson player can do a lot of this stuff in 1999, 2000, uh, which is, which is super interesting to see. Mm -hmm. And you see those skills that I keep, I keep going back to this just because it's so ridiculous to me. We've never seen a player like this in this way in, in the W even since, but it's, it's just like the ability that you had, you see it get more polished over time in the W where she's making these ridiculous passes not necessarily ridiculous passes, but she's able to leverage her ridiculous scoring ability off the drive, off the bounce, and turn it into these really these really good opportunities to play make for teammates. It's just such a shame she wasn't like leading the league in usage. It's ridiculous. And then one more thing before we wrap it up. Um, this is something you brought up to us uh, earlier this week, Em. It was like, what is the best combination of like a front court you could build in WNBA history? With yeah, and not players. just the two. Yeah, not just the two best players, but like the whole being more than right. some of its parts. So, um, for you, what what was the first thing that popped off the screen for you with this? I mean, we're talking about LJ. Um, you know, I actually did my catch scout before I did my LJ scout. We'll get to catch next week. Um, but I'll I'll save that one for later in this. Uh, to me, I was thinking about LJ. What if you pair with Stewie? How do they flap each other? What I what I ultimately came to was with how LJ was so versatile and so excellent a scorer, you want someone who's sort of a dominant physical post score, but also an excellent sort of secondary playmaker and entry passer. That's, and was also defensive four and a half. That's how I came to Candace Parker. Super switchable defensively, obviously by far the best playmaking uh, center in WNBA history. She, she's a good example of actually of a team that it took five, six, seven years into her career for them to actually finally do it. But she's someone that her team figured out, oh, no, this is a four and a half. We want to play next to another four and a half uh, and really reap the benefits of how they can play the center, quote unquote. But yeah, th that's what came to me. There's in terms of the versatility of playing off of each other. Uh, all that Lauren Jackson can do and their combined passing ability mitigate Candace's lack of uh, 
lack of standout shooting. And yeah, that would be ridiculous. I wish we saw it. My, my other thing, if you want to get a little less OP, was LJ plus Tina Thompson. We got them together when Tina was 37 and Lauren was in the last year of her career. They almost never played on the court at the same time, which is a damn shame. But like we talked about, Tina is effectively, possibly, probably, the greatest play finisher of all time in WNBA history. And given Lauren Jackson's um, scoring gravity and her leverage and her ability to pass out of it when she draws the doubles and stuff, I mean, it'd be ridiculous to see what Tina could do with that. From a defensive standpoint, one thing I thought about was Sill, and you mm. compare her, you pair her with LJ. I just think that length, that versatility inside, you you wouldn't score more than sixty points a game against them. <laughs> Pretty easy. See, I want to be able to switch sometimes with LJ, just not only because I want to see it, but but also because I think that gives you some advantages, just given her lateral quickness and her foot strength. You know, you, you'll see in the clips, some of I send you, some of them will be posted on this video, the way that she is able to make make these switches, not routinely, because that's not the scheme, but she's able to make the switches when she has to against these threes, even these twos and force them to pass. She had, did, did that against Diana a couple of times. All right, so thanks for making Ultimate's Basketball your first listen every day. Join the team at the next, back next week for your continued coverage inside the WBA and women's basketball as a whole. Have a great rest of your weekend, everyone.